So thank you so much for being here. Second day of the UNAC conference. Um, we have folks from across the country and the world here with us today in order to bring the movements fighting militarism, racism, and the climate crisis together uh, for peace and justice. My name, as Joe said, is Cassia Laham. Um, I'm a full-time public school teacher down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where it's about 30 degrees warmer right now. And when I'm not busy rolling around in my teacher money, um, I also organize around anti-war activism. I consider myself a full-time activist, and I serve on the administrative committee for UNAC. Um, I was a co-founder of the organization Power, that's People's Opposition to War, Imperialism, and Racism in South Florida. Um, and I also help lead the anti-war efforts of the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. Um, our panel today reflects the theme of this entire conference. Uh, raising the most dire issues facing the people of the world today and trying to draw connections between them. It will likely not be too difficult for those of us in this room to draw those connections because those who re are responsible for perpetuating these issues are really all one in the same class of people. They're profiteers, counting their billions, while the rest of us on planet Earth are busy counting down the doomsday clock. Elites who watch their stocks go up as the rest of us watch US bombs fall down on countries throughout the world. And political leaders who allow white nationalists to march up and down the streets, burning crosses, while people of color in this country are not even allowed to drive or cross the street or stand outside a corner store without being murdered by police. We know who they are. And at this conference, we are here to tell them that they can't hide behind their billions anymore. The people of the world are sick and tired of it. And the amazing people on this panel who I'm very honored to share this table with today, are all leaders in the movements organizing for and demanding change, demanding justice and demanding peace. So with that said, I wanted to um, allow folks to give an introduction of themselves. Um, sitting next to me is Jean-Luc Pierrit, president of the board of directors of the North American Indian Center of Boston. Um, next to him is Mikasi Motema, of People's Power Assemblies, New York City. We got Diane Moxley, activist and attorney and organizer with Green Party of New Jersey. And we got Jeff Mackler, co-founder and administrative committee member of UNAC. So um, panelists, if it's okay, if we can go sort of down the line over here, if you could tell mm -hmm. folks a little bit um, about your activism in combating you know, either militarism, racism, or envir uh, environmental crisis, and what actions you've been a part of, and stuff like that. Uh, thank you, Kasia, for, uh, and to UNAC for inviting me to uh, Manahata. Um, as, uh, as it said uh, by the Lenape people, the Delaware people, um, I also want to recognize the American Indian Community House, uh, who has uh, served uh, the urban Indian population here uh, in New York City. My name is Jean-Luc Perit. I'm originally from New Orleans. I'm a member of the Tunica Biloxi tribe of Louisiana. And it's there where my la uh, family does language and culture preservation work. In Boston, uh, as, as I was introduced, I am the president of the board of directors of the North American Indian Center of Boston. Uh, and I also have a full-time job that I do get paid for, because that's my job that I don't get paid for. Uh, I work for a nonprofit that emerged out of MIT's Center for Bits and Atoms uh, called the Fab Foundation, which uh, uh, fosters the growth of the International Fab Lab Network, uh, 2,000 digital fabrication labs, community-based worldwide in over 100 different countries. Environmentalism and, uh, and anti-militarism I can tell you, uh, just based upon the scopes of the work of uh, North American Indian Center of Boston, we're going into our, uh, we're in our 50th year of service uh, for the New England Native American community, which includes uh, American Indians, Alaska Natives, uh, First Nations who go to Boston under the Jay Treaty, um, and other indigenous peoples within New England. Uh, we do work, we have a, currently have a, an initiative called the Massachusetts Indigenous Legislative Agenda. And it's with that we uh, partner with organizations uh, such as Massachusetts uh, Peace Action um, and Mass uh, 350. 
um, along with other along with other organizations, uh, United American Indians of New England is another uh, important partner. Uh, but we have uh, five issues across a number of bills, taking down uh, native mascots. Uh, 40, uh, 40 public schools in Massachusetts have these mascots. Changing up the, the flag and seal of Massachusetts. It's a banner that uh, makes it very hard to do the work that we do because it's evocative of uh, King Philip's war, war that was fought almost 350 years ago. And still to this day, when we, uh, when we do uh, civic engagement in Massachusetts, we are doing it under a flag uh, with a native figure that has been composited, taking the head of uh, Thomas Littleshell, an Ojibwe chief, the bones of uh, a Massachusetts person who was excavated in an archeological dig and uh, above him is the disembodied uh, arm of Miles Standish brandishing a sword. And the motto of Massachusetts, uh, we seek peace but by the sword. There is mas mascots, there is the flag and seal, uh, there is Indigenous Peoples Day over Christopher Columbus Day, but we're also pushing for um, state alignment with uh, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act and uh, also a state education uh, commission for uh, American Indian and Alaska Native students. 79% uh, graduation rate, two times uh, the rate of suicide, that of their white peers. Uh, so we're trying to do everything we can to get our kids uh, healthy. Uh, out of school into into colleges and uh, become more civically engaged so that they can talk out uh, talk about uh, these issues of anti-militarism and and environmental justice and so I just want to pass it on to the next panelist here <laughs> hi um, my name is Makasi Matema I uh, organize with people's power assemblies um, We've done a lot of work in terms of Black Lives Matter. Uh, we've been doing it for, well, well over five years now. And um, right now we have a campaign going on against the uh, MTA's fare evasion. Um, you know, you might have seen, yeah, some of the protests going on, uh, a lot of coalition groups working on that. And um, we, we want to highlight the, the role that racism plays in terms of the, the, the way that the MTA and the city in general is trying to extract uh, wealth from uh, poor people and people of color. We also, uh, beyond just the, the sanctions campaign, we like to draw the connections between racism at home and overseas. So we, we do a lot of anti-war protesting and um, we try to remind people that these issues are connected. I mean, um, just as an example, in ways that people don't necessarily think about it, um, if you look at the death of Trayvon Martin, for example, that was a situation where you had this murderer, George Zimmerman, who's saying he fears for his life from this incredibly small young kid. And it's like, this is a pathology of, of white supremacy. And if we look at it as, um, if we only look at it as something that happens within the United States, we kind of miss the whole story. I mean, you can connect the pathology of white supremacy to the Iraq war. Like, the United States is the most powerful military on earth. And for some reason, we came out and said, we're afraid of Saddam Hussein and their weapons of mass destruction. That's the United States saying, we're afraid of a person of color. And they're, and they're armed and dangerous, and we have to do something about them. So at, at People's Power Assembly, like, those are the connections that we try to make. Um, and right now, uh, the newest campaign we're doing is the uh, campaign against U.S. sanctions. Um, because sanctions kill because they do. Uh, the weekend of March 14th, uh, we're encouraging people to take actions in uh, whatever city they organize in, and um, you know we're hoping to build something big. So. Hi, I'm Diane Moxley. I am a, involved in leadership with the Green Party of New Jersey. I also organize with uh, a few different anti-war, anti-imperialism orgs. So uh, we have some flyers today for the March on the Pentagon is doing a international working Women's Day forum on Saturday, March 7th. So that is one of the organizations I work with um, 
We have organized the uh, March on the Pentagon back in 2018, and 2019 we did a rally throughout the targets of the military industrial complex and the war machine. And uh, my professional life, I am an attorney. For 14 years, I was a legal services attorney in Newark. I am a solo practitioner, and I keep my foot in the door with public interest law by um, handling pool cases for the public defender's office in the North area. Um, I have been an activist my entire life, but I did sort of get, I guess, uh, reinvigorated and uh, amped up with the Occupy Wall Street movement back in 2011. Um, We've built wonderful connections there, and I'm glad to see all the different branches out that have kept going and morphing and changing. Um, I also am organizing with the Peace Congress in New Jersey. That was something that came out of the Peace Congress in Washington, D.C. back in, it was 2018, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a mobilization to combat the Trump military parade, which went, as soon as Trump realized that activists were organizing and gathering and coming to D.C., he called off his parade. And with all the wonderful activists, yeah, it's a good job for everybody mobilizing that. And since we had, uh, I wasn't able to be at the Peace Congress in D.C., but since there were so many activists gathered, a uh, group of activists decided we're going to go forward with a peace congress and with the mission being fighting the wars at home and abroad and i think that's why a lot of us are here today and on the panel today and the peace congress in new jersey we did a peace congress in princeton last year and it was pretty successful. We had um, about 30 people and they're activists and organizers where we're talking about what are the problems? How can we better mobilize? How can we reach out to communities that aren't traditionally represented in the anti-war movement? And this year, uh, I'm very excited to be working with Tom Violet, who is here today. He's with the Green Party and some other orgs as well and uh, Jan Weinberg, we are organizing a peace congress in Newark, and with the focus on the wars at home and abroad, we are organizing with the communities in Newark. So we have some wonderful orgs there, like the Newark Water Coalition, who's fighting for clean water in Newark. We're working with the New African Black Panther Party, and we're bringing in the orgs that have been doing the work in that community. And we're gonna talk about how all of our issues are connected. So what are we missing? How can we grow? The best way we can grow is if we're all working together. Um, I also organize with Extinction Rebellion uh, in New York and New Jersey. In New York, I, I was part of the first nine arrestees. We blocked 8th Avenue for, gosh, I think, Pretty long time for 8th Avenue on a Saturday afternoon. And uh, I did, I got arrested a few times in New York after that, but you know, you guys have seen <laughs> lots of just, you know. No <laughs> um, I was really happy to be able to take Extinction Rebellion into New Jersey. And one thing that really motivates me with Extinction Rebellion is something that is unique to Extinction Rebellion in the US which is the fourth demand. And that is focusing on the communities that take the brunt of <coughs> environmental chaos. So we're talking about uh, indigenous sovereignty issues, we're talking about um, establishing uh, reparations and remediations that are going to be led and for black people, indigenous people, people of color, poor communities, for the years of environmental justice that they have suffered. And um, I really wanted to take that vibe yeah. into New Jersey. So New Jersey's first action was with the Nork Water Coalition, who has been fighting for four years despite nationwide blackout of their hard work. So we were asked by the Nork Water Coalition to do the direct action component 
And we had a very successful action at the MTV Video Music Awards on August 26th. I'm sure we're all activists in the room. We could uh, um, talk about, uh, it wasn't a perfect action, but with our arrests and, mm -hmm. and Tom Violet again, he was one of the brave, um, were we five arrestees that, not me, but I was being support. Yeah, and um, it's never a perfect action, but a perfect action in that we finally got nationwide attention. That action was on a Monday. I believe it was that Wednesday that Cory Booker was finally talking Nork water. Mind you, he was the mayor of Nork when this crisis began. Um, there's some shifting of the blame, but you know, allegedly he lives in Nork. Um, sorry. <laughs> I think he may drink the water occasionally. Um, so finally, we were able to get the attention that is needed and pipes are now being replaced. Um, yeah, just making sure I, I think I touched on everything. Uh, not everything, because I know we all do a lot, but uh, thank you all for coming today and I'm excited to uh, participate. Excuse me, I'm addicted to standing up. <laughs> uh, I'm Jeff Mackler, and uh, I'm one of the founders and administrative committee members of UNAC. I'm the director of the Northern California-based mobilization to free Mumia Abu Jamal. We organized a demonstration uh, a decade ago of 25,000 people to free Mumia, and we're still struggling to free him, and we're back in the race in court again with a chance to win. Mm -hmm. I, uh, long I've been a long-term activist in the civil rights movement. I was arrested nine times. I led the first northern sit-in in Ohio way back in the 50s. I'm on the steering committee proudly to keep the four Venezuelan embassy defenders out of jail. We toured all of them in California, basically sponsored by UNAC and 1520 other groups and raised $8,000 for that effort. I'm a 20-year veteran of the Teachers Union. It's an organizer and a teacher. I'm the National Secretary of the Political Party Socialist Action and I'm Socialist Action's 2020 candidate for the presidency of the United States running against the Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> Alan Greenspan, the former head of the Federal Reserve, wrote a thousand page book recounting his life. And when it got to answering the question of why the United States organized a coup in 1953, to overthrow the democratically elected government of Iran, he basically said, you don't understand the 800 pound gorilla in the room. And what was that? He said, oil is a national security interest of the United States, central. The same oil is a national security interest of the United States in Iran today and in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. It's no coincidence that the United States threatened to obliterate organized coups and and uh, use military intervention in those countries because they want to be the dominant fossil fuel nation in the world. Tragically, they wreak horror on the people of the world. Their sanctions and embargoes have brought those countries to their knees. Iran can't sell oil anywhere. Its scientists are murdered by American officials and uh, secret agents and it's uh, Centrifuges are interfered with cyber war to blow up, and its oil is kept off world markets in order to dominate with regard to the United States. The same thing with Ukraine. The central reason for the United States backing a fascist-led coup in 2014 was that eastern Ukraine is the fifth largest resource in the world with regard to shale oil, and they wanted to frack the Ukraine in order to be the prime 
producer and shipper of oil to Eastern Europe as opposed to Russia, which it is now. The same thing in Syria. Joe mentioned the assassination of Soleimani and they called him a terrorist. But it was Soleimani, as a younger man, who fought against the United States-backed Saddam Hussein 10-year war against Iran that killed 1 million Iranians and 800,000 Iraqis. We didn't know that the United States uh, was actually backing both sides until Contragate when it turned out the United States was selling tow missiles to its arch enemy, the demonized Iranian government. But once again, the purpose was to keep the oil of these two oil-rich nations off world markets in order to preference American capitalism's oil industry. With regard to Syria, I want to raise an important point. Because with regard to Syria, and Venezuela, and Nicaragua, and Cuba, and Libya, and every poor and oppressed nation on earth, UNEX starts with the single proposition that we support the right of oppressed peoples and nations to self-determination free from imperialist intervention. <laughs> UNEC takes no formal position on the governments of these countries. That's not for us to determine. Our job is to keep the hands of U.S. imperialism off to allow people to decide their own future free from imperialist intervention. Mm -hmm. In Syria, they have to demonize the Assad regime in order to justify it, and they blame the murder of 500,000 uh, Syrians on the Syrian government. What they leave out is that the United States along with NATO and the Arab monarchies, backed and financed a literal army of Al-Qaeda and the Nusra Front to take over two-thirds to three-quarters of Syria and plan to divide it up among U.S. allies in the region. UNAC opposes that and we demanded that the United States get out. We demanded that the anti-war movement regardless of their position on the government of Syria or any other government on earth, demand that the United States get out. All of these wars are racist wars. Every one of them is organized to demonize the oppressed people. People from the Middle East in the training camps of the United States Army are called sand niggers. Muslims are demonized in the United States and the new Trump order extends the ban on immigration to seven different countries which have a majority Muslim population. UNEC is opposed to all discrimination and all racist policies of the United States at home and abroad. Joe Lombardo in his talk last night made a couple of interesting observations. He compared the anti-war movement of yesteryear with today. And Joe said that the three issues that we're discussing on this panel and that we discussed last night are interwoven and the source of the problem with regard to all three is the system that we operate under. He said it was a capitalist system that has to be brought down. The question is how do we do that? <coughs> UNEC has a couple of principles, and I'll close on these. One is the united front. We all work together, regardless of political party, regardless of our views on this or that country, to bring the troops home now and to use the vehicle of mass mobilization to do that. Mass mobilization is not just having a number of people in the streets, it's the organizing that goes into it. But more important, it breaks down the idea in people's minds that we are weak and isolated and can't fight City Hall. And when we get people out in the streets and they look at each other, they begin to realize that they are the majority and that the government doesn't represent them in any sense. In the old days, in my days, the government did not use the tactic of mass mobilizations. They were afraid of it. It was only the social movements, the civil rights and anti-war movements, the women's liberation movements, the LGBT movements. Today we see a new phenomena. 
right after we had 2,000 people in the streets of San Francisco organized by UNEC and others on January 4th, within a few days, to our amazement or perhaps not, the Democratic Party called anti-war demonstrations saying no war against Iran, which is the same demand that we raised. With Trump's inaugural, high officials in the Democratic Party organized millions, four and a half to five million women in the streets to attack Trump, as if the Democratic Party was free from prejudice and discrimination and sexism against women. They want to co-opt the movement, not only with a combination of NGOs, but with politicians who are capable of talking out of both sides of their mouth. The same Democrats who said they were against war basically condemn President Trump for withholding aid, they claimed, to Iran. But none of them mentioned that the United States orchestrated a coup in, I meant Ukraine, or orchestrated a coup in Ukraine to back a fascist government to promote U.S. and European Union interests in that country. None of us in this room are in the business of backing fascist-led coups, openly fascist. But the United States did, and here are the Democrats saying we should have forgiven further arms to fight a worthless war against the Ukrainian people. I'm running for president because I don't think there are any solutions within the framework of patching up capitalism. It can't be reformed. It's inherently racist, sexist, homophobic, warmongering, and against the environment. The idea that we're talking about a catastrophic problem of climate change and yet the United States is increasing its fossil fuel use, increasing its fracking, increasing its offshore drilling, and increasing its wars for fossil fuel around the world. That's an insane proposition. No problem on this magnitude can be solved within the framework of maintaining the private ownership of the fossil fuel industry, which is the norm in the United States. It wasn't a coincidence that they appointed Rex Tillerson, the head of ExxonMobil, to be the Secretary of State. It's not unusual that they interchange politicians and government officials on the one hand with the corporate leadership to run the country. It's those people that do. So I'm proud to participate in UNAC. I'm proud to be a founder of UNAC. And I'm proud to work with so many people who disagree with me on what brand of socialism you stand for that's fine. That's what a real united front is. It's a fighting organization to get people in the streets to challenge the imperialist wars and the system that makes these wars a necessity. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Um, when you said you had a 30-minute speech prepared, I thought you were kidding. Um, <laughs> that was a lot of really important information. Thank you so much, though. Um, yeah, it's an anti-war conference, people, you know, we have a lot to say. Um, so what I'm going to do um, is just sort of ask our panelists some questions that are uh, specialized for their particular areas of work and activism and have them speak a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to ask that our panelists sort of keep it relatively brief so that we can then open up the panel to questions from the audience. So. Um, Makasi, if it's okay, I would love to start with you. Um, uh, the question is, so we have all these various issues and Jeff did a really good job sort of talking about the connections between uh, militarism, racism, and the environment. Um, but I wanted to ask you specifically, given your area of work, um, how racism is used to perpetuate American wars of aggression abroad? That's a good question. I don't think... Um you can have American wars abroad without racism. Mm. Like, everything about our justification for war, I look at um, countries that we're interfering with right now, Bolivia, Venezuela. Um, one of the first things they say about a country to get the American public to, um, 
to, to criticize and to feel comfortable with intervention is they say the country is corrupt, you know, like it's plagued by corruption. And, and words are important. Corruption means that, that you're willing to take a bribe. It means that you're dishonest. It means that you're a liar. If someone said that Bolivia was plagued with liars, we would all understand that that is an incredibly racist thing to say. But the media and the US government codes their language and they say it's, it's plagued by corruption and so they get to say it. They put the idea in our head but they don't have to take credit for their racism. And as soon as you say that, people believe it. And, and why do people believe it? Because when it comes to people of color, we believe that they're more criminal. Like that's the, that's the pathology again, that's the pathology of white supremacy is that we're trained from when we're young to believe that people of color are more criminal. That's why when Ronald Reagan said that there are welfare queens, we immediately believe it. Like, yeah, you can't trust people of color with money. You can't trust people of color to run their own governments. You can't trust people of color to uh, maintain a democracy. So you need white people to come in and basically fix it for them. And so you, the, the US government, they just, they drop these terms and people believe it because they've been force fed white supremacy their whole lives. Um, awesome, thank you. Does, does anybody else on the panel want to chime in on that? Or, okay. Um, okay, so on the same thread, um, and sort of bringing the wars abroad back to the wars at home, um, Jean-Luc, um, one of the questions I had here was um, how does increased war affect black and brown communities and other uh, communities here at home? How, how does war abroad sort of affect those uh, disadvantaged communities in the United States? So I wanted to um, first start with the idea that um, being here representing North American Indian Center of Boston, um, not speaking for, but, um, but hopefully uh, being representative of, of indigenous peoples, I just want to like just frame that political designation uh, because there are indigenous nations that are within the borders of this nation. And within those indigenous nations, they reserve the right to determine their own membership. That means that there are black and brown people in our indigenous nations. So that's, that's an important designation, first of all. But I do want to like talk about, you know, just this in increased war, how does that affect our communities? When you look at the representation of the populations within the military, proportionate to the populations within the, the whole country itself, Native peoples are overrepresented. Uh, African American people are overrepresented. When we look at customs border protection, half are Hispanic, and I use that term based upon like the language of the of the census and all but you know also for ice agents almost a quarter of them are are hispanic as well and so why is it that the military why is it that these th these government jobs that we are constantly our bodies are constantly being used to police ourselves why is that an adequate intervention for things like the school to prison pipeline within this country. Why is it that in order to, you know, provide for yourselves and for your families, you have to go into the military, you have to work for the government, you have to do these things that do harm to ourselves. It's not out of self-hatred, it's about self-preservation for some of our families. So we have to we have to recognize that. We have to you know, we have to just, you know, be conscious of, of why it is that we do what we do. And, um, oh God, that was, yes, in Boston on March 5th, we are going to be recognizing the 250th anniversary of the murder of Crispus Attucks, who was black and indigenous. He was the first casualty of the American Revolution, so-called. But we're going to honor that, honor that, that sacrifice because our bodies are continually, continuously sacrificed. We are continuously affected by state violence, uh, police brutality, and, and all, of these, all of these issues 
So we're, go we're going to recognize that history and we're going to uh, frame it in the context of what our communities are going through today. Um, so I hope that, you know, that that's some context, but you know, it's an ongoing conversation within our communities. So anybody else wants to chime in on that? Um, awesome, thank you, Jean-Luc. Let's see, Diane. Okay. <laughs> um, Dan, you sort of, you touched on this already in your opening, but if you can sort of draw a strong connection between um, militarism and environmental degradation, um, that would be great. Okay, sure. Um, and we know the, the connection has, you know, s several different dimensions, but we know that basically our military industrial complex controls our government and the fossil fuel industry controls our government. So we all know that, you know, when is the last time we've had a war that is actually for our national security? Hmm. And we know that what's happening now is our wars are being fought for, for greed, for profit, for power, and to uphold US imperialism. And what happens is it's really just a, a vicious cycle because wars that are fought for oil also have the side effect of creating instability in the countries that we're seeking to exploit resources. So we have a refugee crisis. We have a refugee crisis also from the environmental degradation that is occurring. Because you know, even um, there was a, a report recently by the Department of Defense that is talking about the fact that environmental chaos is leading to more insecurity that is going to how, how you know uh, they're admitting that basically the environmental crisis is creating the chaos. It's a cycle, but. We are, have to be the ones, the activists have to be the ones that tell them, you know, remove the cur curtain, lift the veil, and point the finger at the military industrial complex, the US military, because they are the world's largest polluter. Um, so, you know, it's, it's our job to get the word out because the propaganda machine is strong. The propaganda machine that is funded by the military industrial complex and the fossil fuel industry. So, um, you know, at, and again, the, at the same time, the government and the oil industry is putting out their massive propaganda denying climate change. Um, you know, we do have the crazy man in the office. Um, as you all know, I'm, I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. Um, but we do have a crazy man in the office that, that needs to go. Um, I don't know what you know, road you're all on. We're all going to be on different roads. But you know, no matter what, he has to go. I'm hoping that we don't have another neoliberal in the office that just does the dirt, the chaos, the insanity in secret and politely with nicer words. So. Um, and it's important also to note, we talk about that wars are fought for oil. It's not only just oil, it's we have other resources that are being uh, basically you know, captured and stolen by corporations. Um, things like lithium, rhodium, iridium, and more. And this increases the chaos that is connected to our military and government, uh, our military industrial complex. We have AFRICOM in Africa, which their sole mission is to control the resources on the continent of Africa. We have overthrow of governments like in Bolivia, which is done to also plunder natural resources. So um, that's how you can see that all of our issues are connected. And um, I, I take the root of direct action and activism. And I think we're really gonna have to step up our game. And we can't go on the back burner because of this being a presidential season. We need to call out all of our politicians 
even progressive Dems who kind of have a little bit of an illusion of being lefty. Uh, we need to call, we don't have anyone in, of the Democratic candidates that's actually anti-imperialist. Mm -hmm. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, maybe their, uh, the, their supporters can call them to task on things like in the war, the military budget, and imperialism. Yeah, it's interesting, Diane, right, because you have um, one party sort of promotes itself, right, as the environmental justice party, right, the Democrats, um, and yet you'll never see them tackle war and imperialism, right, which is the number yeah. one, right, we leave the biggest carbon footprint, um, we have weapons that leave total environmental chaos behind, um, and if they really did actually care about the environment, perhaps one of the first things they would do is step in and try to stop the billions of dollars they're funding into the U.S. military, yeah. right, which leaves the biggest footprint behind. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we have a couple of progressive Dems that are in Congress right now. Um, we know there's the squad. Um, the only two I'm impressed with is uh, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar. And they're not perfect. They need to be pushed by the representatives. But we have others that run with the the label of being a progressive dem and they're really crappy on the military and imperialism and their supporters should call them out they're there to represent you don't be you know hesitant to call it like you see it yeah yeah and that billions that they spend on the military could be funneled into our communities, right? They could be funneled into our uh, infrastructure and the communities that need it most and redoing mm -hmm. water pipes and, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, awesome, thank you. Um, so, um, Jeff, I feel like this is a question for you, right? So we have all these movements and UNAC is really uh, focused on bringing all these movements together. How do you think we do that? How do we bring these movements, environmental, uh, justice, racial justice, um, peace justice. How do we how do we try? Because we know that they're connected, right? And we all agree that they're connected. And yet, we don't really have one big movement of all these things together. How how do we sort of start building that? Karl Marx answered the question for this panel. <laughs> he said, "Capitalism creates its own grave diggers. It creates working people who find that they cannot live within the framework of the capitalist system." It creates a generation of young people today where a majority of the youth under 29 and now under 39 prefer <laughs> a vision of socialism rather than capitalism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's because these young people and an increasing part of the entire population is affected by a crisis-ridden capitalism that has to threaten the destruction of the planet through environmentalism through environmental destruction, where you have a 17-year-old young woman, Greta Thornburg, organizing 5.5 million people to protest because the system is threatening the future of young people. Student debt is threatening. Endless wars are threatening. Racism, the prison industrial complex, it's for profit. Mm -hmm. The prisons are increasingly privatized. And the average prison wage today is 50 cents an hour. So why hire a Latino to work in the fields at minimum wage if they get paid at all before they deport it, when you can hire a virtual slave in the prison industry? The question is not that the people are not radicalizing around the world. We've seen millions protest in Chile, in Lebanon, all over the world against the horrors of the system of capitalism. The question is, what do we tell them to do? What do we organize them for? That's why I said it's not enough to say, oh, the Democrats are calling an anti-war demonstration. Everybody should go there. We should call the anti-war demonstrations, and we should have our own speakers and our own program, and eventually our own united candidates who fight against the system to challenge the system at its core. In truth, Donald Trump or any Democrat or Obama, they don't make the fundamental decisions. They don't write the tax codes. They don't draw up a $4.7 trillion budget. Those are the corporate executives who funnel their ideas 
into the institutions that decide how the trillions of dollars in government money, which is our money, are allocated. So we start with how do you unite the people in action? And in my view, the best organizations that do that most effectively will get the best hearing on how to challenge the system itself. But the challenge stops, starts, in my opinion, with the rejection of anything but building an independent, powerful movement based on the interests of the people in the streets. Mm -hmm. That's what UNAC is for. Mm -hmm. It's against all the wars at home and abroad, all the racist wars, all the oil wars, and all the slaughtering wars. And I'll just stop with this. The New York Times a couple of weeks ago had an amazing article that said that one nation on earth, one corporation on earth holds the greatest amount of Venezuelan oil. Do you know who that corporation is? Chevron. A U.S. corporation after a coup, isolation, sanctions, embargoes, war, starvation that killed 50,000 Venezuelans, the, Uni the United States forced forced the Venezuelan government to sell off a significant portion of its oil to Chevron Corporation. And Chevron had to first check with President Trump and said, well, we have an embargo and blockade. We're not allowed to do this business. What do you think? And Trump openly stated, according to the New York Times, if we don't buy these <laughs> materials, some other competitor nation will. So here you have the anomaly of an unbelievably monstrous coup, the installation of a fake president that has no support in the country, the embargoing and the threatening any Latin American country or any country in the world that if you trade with Venezuela, you're cut off, and the literal stealing of Venezuelan Citco oil from banks across the United States, and the end result? The monstrous end result is that Venezuela is forced to sell off its own arms and legs, so to speak, to feed its people in the face of an imperialist, monstrous attack. That is repeated every in every country across the globe, where the United States has 100 and 1,100 military bases in some 175 countries. So we bring the movements together by fighting for all of us, which is different than what we did in the Vietnam War at the McCarthy era. We had one issue, bring the troops home now. We didn't touch the others for the most part. It was a red baiting still McCarthy era. Today we have to take up all the issues and as the panelists said yesterday, they're all connected because they all flow from a rapacious system that cannot be reformed, capitalism. Does anybody else want to chime in on that, um, on that question? Give any input? We're good. I'm just giving people space, just in case you have some extra comments. Um, okay, so here's a maybe controversial question that everybody on the panel can feel free to answer or not answer. Um, but the Trump presidency, I mean, we're living under, um, we're, we're in a crazy time with Donald Trump, and um, I feel like nobody knows where to put their left and right feet anymore every time he speaks or sends out a tweet. Um, and, you know, he's unpredictable in a lot of ways, right? Um, it's a, it was a little bit easier to predict some of the moves of, of uh, previous presidents, previous commanders in chiefs. Um, but that said, um, what do you think of the Trump presidency as far as its threat level? Is the Trump presidency more dangerous than previous presidencies that we've seen in the United States? Um, is it the same and the mask has just been taken off, right? And we can see... Um, the American presidency for what it is, or does he, you know, is he more or less dangerous? What do we think? I mean, as far as impact on the world, impact on, um, you know, racial minorities in the United States, impact on the environment, is there a increased threat level with Donald Trump? Anybody? Oh, we all want to go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, everybody. <laughs> go ahead. Oh. Okay. Um, I don't look at him as I might. This might be controversial. Hopefully not here. I don't see Bush. Uh, excuse me, Trump. <laughs> Trump. 
<laughs> same thing. I don't see Trump <laughs> as being more dangerous than what came before him. Um, it's the neoliberalism of Bill Clinton, and I'm going to kind of call it, you know, Bush. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Bush is kind of a a neoliberal um, Obama, but I mean that in the in the worst way, not in a gentle way. <laughs> <laughs> we had Obama, um, yeah, and and Bush. He was, in some ways, which I know this is going to sound crazy. He was almost less dangerous because he was um, a puppet. But he was a the puppet masters were the military industrial complex and uh you know fossil fuel industry so yeah we all know what he did it was really obvious and blatant that we had two ridiculous wars that were um illegal wars especially the well both wars but the iraq war was you know we used he used propaganda and lies to get us into and we're still there, oh my gosh, how many years? 19 years later and 17 or 18, uh, 18 years later, we're still there. And then we had Obama who was giving us hope and change. Um, I was actually conned in 2008, I'm gonna admit, I voted for Obama in 2008. Don't hate me, I'm sorry, I've learned. Um, but. Um, I believed that he was going to get us out of Iraq and Afghanistan, and he escalated Iraq and got us nothing. Um, one thing that drove me absolutely mad was um, when the Obama administration was pushed by Secretary, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton to do regime change in Libya. Um, and creating and further destabilizing the region, which then led to more terrorism and weapons in the hands of terrorists. And we had drones, beginning with Bush, but we know Obama, he was also uh, the king of drones. And you know we're going over sovereign countries' airspace, uh, committing assassinations, and killing innocent people and increasing terrorism. So they might be a kinder and gentler chaos, war, destruction, so they're not gonna say words that offend you. Um, we now have an overt fascist in the White House, but there's elements of fascism in neoliberalism, and that's what led to where we are today. Um, I think I'm in somewhat safe company to say I see them all as just different sides of the same wicked animal, whatever you want to call it. And yeah, we need to get him out this year, absolutely, but we need to fight for issues and not stop our activism just because there's a show going on and some kind of fake facade of an election going on. Um, so yeah, I'll be doing my work in the streets and uh, I know I'll see some of you out there as well. <laughs> you know, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson got fired. How many of you know why he got fired? He was sitting in in a National Security Council meeting which Trump bounced in and said to everybody, you know, I think we ought to increase our tactical nuclear arsenal 1,000%. And he left the room, and Tillerson said, the guy's a fucking moron. But he's a fucking moron who says what every other administration does. He's not civilized in his dialogue, and if he changed a few of his racist, sexist, warmongering language, he'd be totally acceptable. The Democrats and Republicans were unanimous on the budget. They were unanimous on the revised NAFTA, which penciled in on 2,000 of the 9,000 pages new tariffs that benefited American corporations. It was the Democrats who upped Trump's military budget proposal by 40, 50, 60 billion dollars. So in every one of these instances, aside from his crude remarks, which is not getting him very far, 
the fact that we're having a dialogue today, you know, as the Nevada primaries go on, where people are talking about socialism. Last night, I went out for dinner at a Korean restaurant, and there was a table of 15 people talking about socialism. I'm slightly deaf and I couldn't hear it, but my friend said, hey, they're talking about socialism. So we go over there and started a conversation with these total strangers in a Korean restaurant. I'm on tour across the country on the East Coast. Young people are burning with passion about a challenge to the capitalist system. They just don't know yet what it is. So it's not Trump and his crude, racist, sexist, heter homophobic uh, rhetoric. Obama was the great deporter, exceeding Trump. Two and a half million people he deported. It was Obama that filled the jails and did nothing about the prison industrial complex where the United States has the largest number and percentage of people on earth in jail for cheap labor. So, it, and it was Obama who didn't have one of his eight years in power without presiding over yet another war. Mm -hmm. So Trump, do, Trump does the same thing with bipartisan support on every fundamental question. Even Bernie Sanders' proposal for $17.4 trillion to over 10 years to fight the climate crisis, the Green New Deal, does it include the simple proposition that it can't be done within the framework of a private ownership of the oil corporations by the richest people on earth? You can't leave them intact and change anything with regard to the environment. The only way you're going to drive those people out of business is a massive movement with a central focus that is against the system itself. Thanks, Jeff. Um, rest of the panelists, chime in. <coughs> Yeah, um, Donald Trump's favorite president is, uh, if I got this correctly, Andrew Jackson. Um, Mass murdering. Right, so Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson is a genocidal monster, right? So, mm -hmm. and, and that's a president who goes back a while. Like, that's not a recent president. So, I, in terms of Donald Trump's racism, I, I think Donald Trump is as American as apple pie. I, I don't think there's anything new about that. Um, in terms of his incompetence, I think that you couldn't have a president like Donald Trump unless the capitalist state that we have now uh, is in such a state of deterioration. I mean, that's the empire is coming off the rails, and that's why we would allow someone who's not just as racist as Donald Trump, but as incompetent as Donald Trump, to come into power. And what that says to what that says to me is that. Um, that's not going to get better. We're not going to have a better president after Donald Trump. Um, we're not going to have a less racist president after Donald Trump. What we're going to have is desperate white supremacist capitalism trying to take as much as it possibly can, uh, mostly from people of color, but from the working class generally. And unless we organize to stop that, uh, you know, we're in trouble. So if you remember from the beginning, I said that I'm from New Orleans. When I was growing up, we had a governor's election, and it came down to Edwin Edwards versus David Duke. And I remember watching those debates with my parents as a kid, and I said, what are we going to do if he wins? Are we going to move out of Louisiana? I mean, we had cousins on the Choctaw Reservation in Mississippi. I mean, imagine fleeing Louisiana, fleeing New Orleans to go to Mississippi for refuge. <laughs> but I, I, my parents said, you know, no, we'll, we'll stay put. Of course, David Duke did not prevail. But what did happen was that those signs that said, this is Duke country, those signs stayed up for at least a decade. So I just want like everybody to realize that even if my, my friend Jeff down here defeats Donald Trump in November, <laughs> even if he does that, where do all those red hats go? 
Where do all those judges go? He's not going to take them all out with him. So we have, uh, we have a, definitely have a cultural problem that, that we need to address that is that's long overdue. Mm -hmm. We have conversations. We have conversations like reparations. We have conversations, you know, if we talk about environmentalism in a little bit, talking about why did the Paris Climate Agreement not recognize the rights of indigenous peoples? So we have a lot of conversations, a lot of cultural conversations that are coming to the forefront. But we do have to figure out, regardless of what happens to 45, we have to figure out what do we do with the red hats? What do we do with the judges? If I am elected president, not only will UNEC occupy the White House, but it'll be mm -hmm. the Congress of the United States. The people will run the country. If you have a revolution in the United States, capitalism will be abolished. Mm -hmm. We can move to free everything. Free food, free education, quality health care for everyone instantly. We could end the housing crisis overnight we would withdraw 1,100 uh, military bases, we'd close them down. We'd close down the fossil fuel industry by putting trillions of dollars into solar and alternative energy. It's a matter of who's really running the system. If we're running the system, there won't be one racist judge. The judge will be the people, as it is in any democratic working class society. So I'm not worried about getting elected and sitting in the White House all by myself and inviting <laughs> my friends out there to have a steak dinner. If I'm elected, it'll be on the basis of collectively building a mass united movement to throw the system itself out. So talking about Trump and the Republicans and the Democrats um, and the you know two sides of the same coin or two cheeks on the same butt as some people like to know. <laughs> Um, environmentalism, though, has still been able to become a topic of conversation, um, and the Democrats have been able to sort of uh, co-opt, take advantage of um, the movements for environmental change and environmental justice. Um, and they seem to be, you know, in almost every Democratic debate, we're seeing environmentalism brought up, right? Um, and we're seeing it on the news, even, you know, the billionaire racist, sexist, uh, pseudo-fascist Mike Bloomberg is talking about saving the environment. Um, so why do you think environmentalism gets to be at the forefront of a lot of these debates and discussions while the other two parts of our conversation um, at this conference and on this panel are left behind. Nobody's really talking about racial injustice. Nobody's really talking about imperialism. Um, why is it that environmental environmentalism gets to be at the forefront? And in what way is it sort of being tackled adequately or not? It's a safe issue. Um, they're n they don't want to talk about racism. They don't want to talk about the military. But um, most of their plans are, are really, really crappy. They've all put out environmental uh, plans for undoing climate chaos. Um, they either don't have, they're not, they're either not touching on environmental justice, they're not touching on the military, they don't have strict, strong deadlines and target dates. Um, even the best plan of any of the Dems that are running right now, and it, you know, I, I'll say it's Bernie Sanders' plan is not terrible but it doesn't have target dates. It touches on environmental justice, but it doesn't touch on the need, uh, or it's not ex explicitly stating what the need for demilitarization is. So it's, it's you know, loosey-goosey, not solid stuff. And yeah, they're not gonna talk about racism because they're, systems of government uphold white supremacy, racism, and the military industrial complex. So, and we have to demand uh, their supporters. So if we have any Bernie supporters in here, 
you, you got to push him. You have to push him now. Um, I don't want to hear, wait till he's in the White House and we'll push him. No, push him now and get him to put his plans out. Uh, I did talk about how uh, the Paris Climate Agreement does not uh, recognize the rights of indigenous peoples. And, you know, there's a, there's a conversation to be had, um, not just uh, with the power, the systems of power that we are, that we all sort of have to deal with, but there is a conversation that needs to be had in this room. Right now, uh, complementary to the Green Deal, there is the Red Deal, which talks to people on the left and the grassroots. And a fundamental principle of that is when we talk about divestment, we're talking about not just divesting and we have to be conscious of how we are reinvesting that that capital mm -hmm. you know we can't just do trade-off we can't divest from fossil fuels and then go down to Bolivia and extract all the lithium for electric cars mm -hmm. that flies in the face of indigenous sovereignty mm -hmm. you know when we talk about uh, what's written in Canada right now the struggle is between the hereditary chiefs, the people that are standing for the traditional culture, the language, all of the you know the ancient knowledge, and then those those band councils that are there for economic development, making sure that there's like you know some kind of you know in revenue stream, and that that's something that we deal with here. We have we have to deal internally with our own tribal governments that are making these these decisions based upon you know what is what's going to bring in cash versus what is going to help us stand on our ancestral knowledge so you know we have to we have to like really you know confront all of that stuff and we have to do that you know also in this room you know when when we're asked you know to come to these come to these sessions or come to the marches don't just ask us to come you know a week out and say well can you do a land acknowledgement a land acknowledgement is just for me it's just saying please please can I say you know what I have to say and then uh, if you're just if you're just saying okay you know this is it you know I can't even get my I can't even get my words out thank God I can do that here but yeah, I just want to I just want to put out there, you know, that we have to we have to really have a shift of consciousness, not just about the powers that be, but all the people within this room. And on the same note, um, not to get apocalyptic, but is it is it too late to do something to, for the environment? Are we? you know, sort of past the point of no return when it comes to uh, the, the impact that capitalism and imperialism have had on the planet Earth and really human survival. I mean, what, so what would be the next most important thing that we have to do to make sure that we can be successful in our environmental justice campaigns? Anybody? Destroy capitalism. All right. <laughs> That's all I needed to hear. We can move on. <laughs> um, okay. So with that said, I think we sort of reached our um, time as far as questions to the panel, unless there was something in particular that folks really needed to get out. But otherwise, I wanted to open the floor up to people in the audience to ask our panelists questions. And I do ask that you actually ask a question. I'm looking at you, anti-war people. You, guys, you know, we like to talk about all our knowledge. Um, but actually, at some point, do ask a question, please. And um, I, I will interrupt you at some point if you go on too long. So please, with that said, um, there's a mic. Joe? OK, Joe has a mic. Just raise your hand, maybe. Um, sure. With great power comes great responsibility. OK, um, over here with the hat. I have a question and a sh very short comment. As a revolutionary socialist feminist, here in the belly of the beast, how do you propose to relate the class struggles in the countries under attack by the US, by US imperialism? I say that because I feel that it's very important to 
connect the struggles that are going on in Iran, the struggles of women, the struggles of youth, the struggles of workers that are directly being affected by the sanctions. It's also important to support the Kurds, an indigenous nation in the Middle East that's up against the Syrian regime. It's important also to support, to not just see all the upsurge within these countries as the product of U.S. imperialism. There, to do that, if we do that, we take away the agency of the people in, the, in these countries. They're not totally the dupes of American imperialism. They have a right to their dreams as much as we do. And I feel, and I'll end, I feel that this is extremely important in order to raise the consciousness in this country to really bring down the imperialist monster. Thank you. Uh, 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 relating the struggles in different countries. Okay. Can I answer? People of color in Harlem and uh, people of color in Bolivia have something in common, and it's that they live on valuable real estate. Uh, so whether you talk about the regime change and trying to get lithium in Bolivia, or you talk about gentrification, um, the struggle is the same. The capitalist, white supremacist ruling class is going to use violence to take what you have. And it, it, so people of color have to, wherever they live, and, and their white allies have to understand that it's the same struggle. And when the capitalists win, we lose. And when we win, we win, right? So. We all win. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let me, that's, that question is one of the most important ones that divide our movement. UNEX starts with the premise that we support the right of self-determination of every oppressed people, oppressed nations. That means oppressed nations like Bolivia, Venezuela, Iran, and so on. We want to keep the imperialist beast out of those nations. We don't want the United States to obliterate Iran or Venezuela. But the question is, well, what's our attitude towards the struggles of working people in all of these nations, which are also capitalist? We could take two answers. We could say, hands off, condemn both sides, equal blame, stay out of it. If that was the case, UNEC would go out of business tomorrow. Our starting point is to support their right of self-determination. And indeed, if any of us had mass forces in those countries faced with an imperialist intervention, if we weren't on the side in the forefront of opposing that intervention, we wouldn't have any credibility with the people of those countries at all. That's critical. If you want to make a revolution in Iran, advance the cause of workers in Nicaragua, or anywhere on earth, you don't stand a chance of getting a hearing from those people if you're on the side of the imperialists, if you're neutral on the war, if you spend your time focusing on the evils of the capitalist regimes as opposed to the immediacy of an imperialist war and takeover. Socialists want to build for revolution in every country on earth, but the starting point in the history of every one of these countries, from the Russian Revolution on down, is to support the right of self-determination of oppressed people. That gets you a hearing. That gets you in the door. That gets you in a position of uniting workers, not only against the imperialist threat, but building a revolutionary party in that country that can challenge the capitalist system, which has to be challenged everywhere. The real point of this question is, in the movement today, we have a major division. We have people who refuse to join with UNAC in our mobilizations because UNAC doesn't sufficiently hate the Assad regime or the Gaddafi regime or the Maduro regime or the Ortega regime. That's not our responsibility. This equal blame Third camp, we're revolutionaries, we're against everybody. We make an equation between U.S. imperialism and a poor nation. That's the downfall of the anti-war movement. The and strength of the movement is to get us all into the streets, supporting the right of self-determination, allowing us to have our own individual positions on every country on earth. And one last comment over here, Dan, sir. I'll keep it to a sentence. 
we have to empower our community members to talk about our water and our women. Put those stories out there and people will resonate with them. Jeff touched on it, other people have touched on it. And I want, number one, I want people to say oil and gas every time because it's gas, it's methane that's destroying the climate more than carbon dioxide. So please, when you say oil, say oil and gas because they're, they're connected very much so. But um, also, I think if we strangle the oil and gas industry by pushing the renewables and figuring out how to do that without extracting the other, the other um, minerals and destroying other country companies um, or other whatever. Um, I got up at five and I've had like five cups of coffee to keep going, so excuse me. <laughs> but I really think that destroying, if we can destroy the oil and gas, we are working really hard to destroy the military because they are the bodyguards of the oil and gas industry. They are inextricably linked and it will also, um, and with the divi divestment, somebody mentioned divestment, mm. divesting from the oil and gas industry, they are going to die. They are going to die just because renewables are taking over. So uh, oil and uh, water and uh, sun and solar and wind are taking over. If Iran, what I, my main question is, if we go to the countries where they have these um, mineral resources that we are trying to protect, protect for these countries, like Venezuela, like Iran, mm -hmm. and, and we can get them to move away from those industries, from those mineral resources, um, like oil, sun and wind in Iran is, they've got all kinds of wind, they've got all kinds of sun. If we help them to discourage them from looking for the oil without saying that you cannot use the oil. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but it's just, there's a dilemma there that we have to work out because it is the, the carbon dioxide and the methane that's destroying the planet. And by encouraging countries that have these resources, how do we stop them from, how can we encourage them to go with other resources? I'm not sure if my question came out clear. I no, really right. Right. Mm. Thank you. Oh, I did, I did put out a uh, resolution okay. in 2012 okay. to that Congress that said it is extraction of all minerals that is causing the military to continue going, and I'd like that resolution. Hmm. Okay, so um, I don't know if anybody wants to just add further comments to that. Um, those were good points to raise. Yeah, I would just say, you know, the, the U.S. and especially the U.S. military is one of the world's greatest polluters, so the only thing I can think of is we have to lead by example. Um, I, I don't know how we're, we're going to push other countries on renewables when we, we have a really, really, really crappy record at investing in that. Mm -hmm. um, so those are my thoughts. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Todd uh, from the Poor People Economic Human Rights Campaign. My question is how do you uh, bring awareness to the youth and educate the youth? I think you have some good answers. Do you want to tell us? <laughs> um, I'll just say uh, I think we have to make spaces for the youth and listen to the youth. Um, and I, I think some of our movements have been failing with that. So we need to bring them in and make space and listen more. Yeah, um, if you look around the room, you know, it's definitely, um, we could use some more, you know, under 30s, you know, even under 40s. Um, sorry, I'm not meaning to do a call-out culture, but you know, that, that is the case, you know, and um, I, think, I think in the end, and a lot of people like to compare, sorry, I know I'm not a panelist. Um, <laughs> 
A lot of people like to compare the the movements today with the movements in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and so just in, in comparing those two things, I think that the material conditions are also very different. Um, and, you know, people like to say, oh, back then, you know, when I was 18, we were all on the streets. Like, well, you when you were 18, you were being drafted, right? Um, you know, and there were, there were dire um, issues, you know, facing you specifically as a young person. And right now, I think the issues are so overwhelming and they're so um, great in magnitude and they're so plentiful that it's really hard for, I speak as a millennial, as somebody who is 30, um, there are so many different issues facing this generation um, and all the generations after that, you know, to find the focus is really hard. People care about all sorts of things. Um, and I think that's our job as sort of the conscious element um, and as organizers in a lot of these major coalitions and organizations, um, it's our job to try and um, bring people in and, and create a focus and maybe, you know, doing things like this, you know, raising the various issues and trying to bring them together and showing people that we all share a common enemy um, and that the enemy is the 1% and it's the same people divesting from communities of color. It's the same people throwing billions of dollars into the military. It's the same people that are, uh, you know, drilling for oil everywhere. These are all the same targets and maybe it's not as overwhelming as we think because we can organize together and focus in on um, a similar target. I know that's more philosophical than it is mm. practical um but i think that's something that we could do um and i think another thing we can do is also meet people where they're at you know actually look at where the issues the issues that young people care about the most go from there and then try to bring them into all the other areas of activism mm -hmm. yeah i think it's um when we talk about movement politics historically like i think we get it caught up in the romance of of the, and these idealized uh figures um, and, you know, really when we talk about the actual stories, really it comes down to a handful of people in a one-bedroom apartment just trying to figure out, you know, what to do next. So we really have to first, you know, bring down that, bring down that bar and say, no, this is something that you and your friends can get together and talk about and do something about. But then, too, like, we also need to... Um, you know, no disrespect to Greta, but we need to also say the names of the black and brown youth that have been out there. And she has been, she has been good. She has been good at sharing her platform. But we need to say their names. We need to give acknowledgement to all of our youth who have been out there organizing. So thank you if you've been doing that. Sorry. I know I'm not I'm not even a panelist and I'm like let me answer everything um, but the I, I think the other thing is the the media as well the media has changed um, in the last few decades and it's a more consolidated media framework and they're all working under the same premises you know um, and I think getting our own media out there is also really important getting our own message out to the youth um, and to young people because we're being inundated with 500 stations all telling us the same thing um, so promoting good media you know whether it's you know, online or TV, you know, trying to get uh, control of that and spreading our own information. Mm -hmm. Just a quick point. Um, how many of you participated in one of the demonstrations, about 200, on January 4th saying no war in Iran? Mm -hmm. Right. In San Francisco, we had 2,000 people and half of them were young people. Mm -hmm. And they were generally the most enthusiastic, the most open to ideas. Yes, we're used to seeing a lot of gray-haired people, including at this conference, but I think that's changing. And to the extent that we link all these issues, we'll see that youthful generation not only turning up at the demonstrations, but leading our coalitions and fights. Hi. Uh, my name's Sandra Rivera. I'm from Philadelphia. I'm part of the Poor People's Army and Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. Um, uh, I grew up in a country where, you know, we're taught, you know, to assimilate into the system and to abide by the rules. And I'm not, you know, as youth, you know, I'm 23, we're not doing that anymore, you know? Um, not only are 
not only don't, we don't have the resources, but we are taking those resources back. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know what I mean? Um, we have this talk about um, how people in power are able to, you know, decide and ha make decisions over people's lives who they have no idea what people go through every day. You know what I mean? Just like, I don't know what other people go through, but as a human being, we should acknowledge the fact that not only are our youth and generations after us are not going to have a sustainable earth and society, we're looking towards a better future. We're looking towards not asking for help. We're taking it back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, I just wanted to throw that out there. You know, uh, it, it's not only about the war abroad. It's a, it's a war here mm -hmm. every single day. It's a war on poverty, it's a war on drugs, it's a war on, on human lives. And we're taking it back, that's it. And that's the UNAC slogan, in the wars at home and abroad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to thank you again for, for your work and for, for claiming that. I know that for my family, my, uh, my grandparents' generation uh, my great grandparents' generation, they faced discrimination. They were told, put the, put the Indian side away. You know, don't speak your language. Don't, don't do, assimilate. Go in, go in, and, you know, try to, you know, m make that good living. But, you know, what we're seeing is that your generation is coming up and you're saying, that's not good enough. I need to, I need to know my language. I need to know what my grandparents were, were denied. And that's how we're going to turn the clock back on all of this devastation. So thank you for your, for your work as well. Ajamu, hey. I really appreciate the comments made by all of you, uh, but really appreciate the uh, comment uh, that Jeff made that clearly laid out the ideological line of demarcation between UNAC uh, and others who uh, pretend to be anti-imperialists. I also wanted to just raise a, a question with my, my brother who is uh, representing the indigenous folks. Um, we thank you for raising up the reality that the U.S. is a prison house of nations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In that though, let's, we, we want to be very, very careful about how we recognize that and understand the various voices and perspectives here in this prison house. Uh, when you we understand what you all are trying to do with raising up uh, uh, Christmas addicts. But I can tell you that I was just up in uh, uh, Nova Scotia, uh, Halifax, a couple of months ago, uh, in black communities uh, in which uh, they were on the other side for Christmas addicts. So we want to make sure that in trying to use some of these symbols in a progressive way, that we don't perpetuate a uh, legitimization of this settler colonial project. We say that Christmas addicts was on the other side, the wrong side. We say that this is a continuation of a settler colonial, colonialist uh, project that we have to be opposed to. And so for the U U.S. to be legitimized has to be something that we point out uh, and we oppose. So I just wanted to lay that out uh, in terms of the great work that you all are doing and to remind us that when we use language uh, that is important to understand that we have different perspectives here uh, in this country. So just, uh, just, about, just about the language of it, and I, I did say so-called so-called first casualty because the, the, what we're centering is that it was, it was a murder. Um, and so that's that's what that's what we're that's what we're kind of uh, placing that that and centering that and and actually uh, using that history and bringing it back and saying like look this is still going on in our communities so you know we're just you know we're also you know we're not we're not really we're not legitimizing you know American exceptionalism here. Uh, you know, it, and it is, it is, it is a, it is a prison house uh, for for all of our all of our nations. I mean, right now uh, we live in a world 
where uh, since 1955, uh, a state recognized tribe in Louisiana has lost 98% of its land uh, due to coastal erosion, rising sea levels. Uh, the Ile de Jean Charles Band of Biloxi Chinamacha. We live in a world, and we live. I live. I live and work in Boston, where a uh, little more than 14 years ago, it was illegal for Native Americans to walk the streets of Boston because of the Boston Indian Imprisonment Act, a law that stayed on the books since the 17th century. And it took, it took a measure of solidarity for a journalist of color conference to come in and say, look, if you don't get this law off the books, we're going to pull our conference from, uh, from Boston and you're gonna be out $45 million in economic impact. So we have, to, we have to acknowledge all of these conversations that are not just, not just decades, but centuries back. And we have, to, we have to stand with one another against this colonial experiment. Awesome, thanks. So I think we have time for one more uh, question. I'm uh, CJ with the Minnesota Anti-War Committee. And I've noticed that, <laughs> thank you, Anti-War Committee. <laughs> Uh, a lot of times, U.S. media and the government will use human rights as a cudgel to justify imperialism and to justify these in inter interventions that very much violate human rights. And I was wondering how we can reclaim human rights as a useful concept when it has been so uh, expropriated from the people's movements. That's a good question. And also, uh, it relates to the question, Larry, what's your name? Ajama, I'm sorry, uh, raised. Uh, so and the same committee as you. And that is, the United States, like President Trump praised the human rights demonstrations in, in Iran and uh, made uh, Venezuela and Nicaragua a human rights issue. And as our speaker from Nicaragua said, we have to be wary of these, quote, mass protests that are organized and funded by NGOs and US propagandists in these countries. For example, in Nicaragua, it turns out that the instigator of these mass demonstrations was the Council on Private Enterprise, the Catholic Church, right-wing student organizations and NGOs financed by the United States. There was no, quote, indigenous mass mobilization. And the same, uh, and the same thing happened in Iran. Just a couple of weeks ago, after the assassination of Soleimani, there was a demonstration that was the largest funeral demonstration in history, and then there was a controversy over whether or not to continue the demonstrations that Trump supported. Trump warned, if you touch these peaceful demonstrators for human rights in Iran, you're going to have to deal with us. But Mukta al-Sadr withdrew the support. His party got the largest number of votes in the country, and, his, and he happened to play a key role in fighting U.S. imperialist intervention with the support of the Iranians when the United States attacked Iraq and in the course of that war killed by assassination, murder, and sanctions 1.5 million Iraqis. And Assad was on the right side of that war, opposing the U.S. imperialist intervention physically with an army along with the Iranian army. That's our side against the imperialist intervention. But in these cases, suddenly, the truth came out. The, it was unanimous in the Iraqi parliament that the United States get the hell out of their country. Mm -hmm. They repudiated the idea that the United States was some kind of peaceful neighbor. It went in, ripped off the oil, rewrote the contracts, and now Trump says, if you dare drive us out of your country, we're gonna charge you for the military bases that we built there for you. <laughs> and we're going to sanction you. It made clear to the whole world that the United States was the imperialist aggressor. Whereas people on the other side said, well, look at all these Iranians demonstrating against the government. Yes, there are Iranians demonstrating against the government, 
some with legitimate reasons, but most of them backed by the U.S. imperialist corporations and NGOs and figures who want their own share of the, the rich people who want their own share of the country. So we have to be very careful when we evaluate these protests anywhere in the world. We spent months watching the United States government say, the Venezuelan people want us. The Venez Juan Guaido is, uh, you know, he's our guy. He's uh, democratically elected from the Venezuelan parliament. And they had a worldwide propaganda campaign to convince the world that Juan Guaido was the legitimate president. And that was repudiated by the Venezuelan people, who Joe said are different than most of the people in the world. They are armed with guns in the millions to defend the gains of their society against U.S. imperialism. It's a very dangerous question for us if we decide to be neutral on those questions and not understand the central objectives of the imperialist base. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Mikasi, do you want to give an answer? <laughs> The United States has no grounds whatsoever to talk about human rights mm -hmm. in any context. Um, if, the United, if the United States is concerned about um, the use of poison gas or any kind of uh, toxic uh, poisoning of the people of any country, they can fix the water in Flint right now, right? Um, they can fix, people in Flint, Michigan are being poisoned right now and they can fix it. If the United States is concerned that people are being held in concentration camps in any country, they can fix that right now by releasing people from our border concentration camps. And if the United States is concerned about slavery, they can fix that right now by abolishing the prison industrial complex. So I cannot listen with a straight face to anyone working for the United States government who wants to talk about human rights anywhere else in the world. Okay. All right. So I, I think that pretty much sums up our panel. Thank you so much to the panelists for taking all of my questions and all the questions from the audience. I think it was very illuminating um, and we all learned a lot.